There was a time when if you'd asked me if you should buy a Mac, I'd have flat out said, hell no. They're expensive, they have limited software compatibility options, no realistic prospects for gaming, and in general, simply didn't perform any better than any other Windows-based laptop available on the market. And that's not to say I'm some sort of Windows fanboy, anti-Apple evangelist, in fact, far from it. I've been embedded in the Apple ecosystem for the better part of the last five years now. I'm using an iPad this very moment for my script notes, and I'm recording this very video on an iPhone 12 Pro. But on the subject of the MacBook, I've been forced to reset my expectations. You see, in 2020, Apple did what had long been expected, and they dumped Intel and their traditional x86 architecture, and instead adopted an ARM-based architecture platform, Apple's self-styled M1, Apple Silicon. So today I've got Apple's entry-level MacBook Air and we're going to see how this thing stacks up against some of the other thin and light Windows-based laptops you can get today. But before we do, whether you're an old viewer or a new one, I'd appreciate it if you could just take one second to go and hit that subscribe button. It lets me know that you appreciate the content that I'm producing. Okay, enough about that. Let's go. So quick nod to the specs, this is Apple's M1, eight core CPU, seven core GPU, 256 gigs of storage, upgraded to 16 gigabytes of RAM. As the main differentiator between this year's MacBook Air and the prior iteration is, at heart, its processing core. We're gonna go straight ahead and look at the stats. For the purposes of benchmarking, I've included an array of Windows-based laptops that I've tested recently, and just for giggles, I've also thrown in there a Ryzen 7 3700X desktop grade CPU, just to see how this thing really stacks up. And TLDR, the results are incredible. Starting out in Cinebench R23 with the traditional multi-core tests, the Apple Silicon beat out the nearest Intel CPU in the Lenovo Yoga 9i by a massive 37%. And while its margin of victory dispersed in single core tests, that in itself shouldn't be dismissed given the single core performance dominance that we're used to seeing from Intel CPUs. Things get even worse for Team x86 in Geekbench where we see the M1 chip extend its lead in multi-core tests over its ultralight competitors to a nosebleed inducing 40%. What's more though, in Geekbench's single core tests, we see Intel's performance lead utterly disintegrate under the pressure from the M1, which ends up taking a 12% lead over the nearest Intel chip. But the real standout score wasn't just by how much the M1 beat the Intel thin and light laptop CPUs, it's how close it came to almost beating the workhorse multi-threading machine that is the AMD Ryzen architecture, coming in just 6% shy. Incredible. But Phil, I hear you say, these are just benchmark tests. They're not illustrative of real-world scenarios. Okay. Let's run a real-world scenario. In DaVinci Resolve, an application which has already been optimized to work with the Apple ARM architecture, the M1 chip whooped the nearest Intel laptop, completing a six-minute 4K render more than twice as fast as the nearest Intel CPU. And truth be told, it wasn't lagging all that far behind the multi-threading workhorse in the Ryzen 7. The one blessing for Intel and the x86 architecture is that Apple don't appear to have, yet at least, cracked the graphics processing nut. In Geekbench, the seven M1 GPUs lagged about 11% behind Intel's, truth be told, brilliant integrated XE graphics in OpenCL tests, but it's certainly narrowed in Vulkan and Metal where any lag behind on the part of the M1 chip was well within the margin of error. And in Luxmark, the M1 chip didn't get anywhere near the Iris XE graphics, with Intel anywhere between 20 and 70% faster than the M1 chip, depending on the scene being tested. So I don't think we're going to be seeing Apple crack the high-powered PC gaming market anytime in the near future, but just in case they do, I'll make sure to let you know. So hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Okay, Phil, okay, okay, something has to give. Surely they've had to put a massive pair of jet engine turbines on this thing to help keep it cool. Wrong again. In fact, there is no fan on this thing, just like the mobile phone that you might well be watching this video on right now. In fact, the only heat controlling device they've put on this thing is an aluminium heat sink to help disperse the heat away from the CPU. So if there's no fans, this thing must run really hot, right? 
Staggeringly, no. I mean, when it's under load, I noticed it getting warm, but nowhere near the stinging sensation I've experienced from some other 11th gen Intel CPUs. Now, in amongst all those incredible performance stats, I think we could reasonably assume that the battery life on this thing would be terrible. Well, we'd be assuming wrong. MacBook Air has a 50 watt hour battery, a 30 watt charger included in the box, and thanks to the incredible power efficiency of the M1 chip, I managed to get the better part of 11 hours battery life out of this thing before I finally had to plug it back into the wall. My daily workflow typically involves seven to eight hours of working on a remote virtual desktop, so lots of connectivity over the internet, and then for the final part of the day, I flip this thing over and I get cracking on whichever video I need to edit in Premiere Pro. On previous laptops I've tested, I maybe get the opportunity to open the laptop for a half hour, an hour, before I need to plug it into the wall. Once I started editing on this thing, I got a whole extra three hours out before it finally hit the dirt. This thing has the best battery life I've ever used on any thin and light laptop ever, period. But I'm an example of a person who will use their own device for work. If you're using your laptop purely for casual purposes, it is completely reasonable and completely feasible that you could charge this thing up at the start of the week and simply not plug it back in for entire days at a time. It's staggering. The build quality is everything we've come to expect from Apple. Well, visually, it remains stunning. Soft, smooth, curved edges around the outside make the thing delightful to hold and carry. Machined aluminium all over means you'll still be the coolest looking cat in the coffee shop. And at just 1.3 kilos, you'll have no trouble carrying this thing from home to office. What was an office again? Remember when we used to go into the office? Time for the obligatory one finger lift test. Nice. Display wise, we're in the sweet spot. It's 1440p, quad HD, Hands down my favorite resolution. It's probably the nerdiest thing I've ever said in my life. What that means, you get a ton more pixels than regular old 1080p HD, but the sweetest thing at all is that it's a 16 by 10 rather than 60 by nine aspect ratio. I know I bang on about it in all of my videos, but the truth is once you've used it, you'll never go back. That extra vertical headroom makes all the world of difference when you're doing literally any task under the sun from browsing the web to doing full-blown video editing. Just love it. The MacBook Air still has Apple's magic keyboard, but frankly, it's still brilliant in comparison to most of its competitors. It's absent any real key travel, yet feels superbly tactile. And truth be told, the only laptop I've used with a better keyboard is the Dell XPS 13, which just has nicer feeling keycaps. These are actually starting to feel a little bit on the plasticky side, but that didn't make it any less brilliant in terms of getting up to speed nice and fast. The minute I started typing on this thing, it felt like I'd been typing on it for years. Now ports, finally, maybe an area of criticism for this year's MacBook Air? Well, I guess it really depends on your point of view. We have two Thunderbolt 4 USB-C ports, which are both capable of charging the device. So there's no option at all for any kind of USB-A, HDMI, SD card reader, micro SD card reader, or the like. So you're gonna end up living the dongle life. Apple have always been sort of ahead of the curve in killing off ports and USB type A is no exception. The industry is slowly but surely going towards USB-C. The trackpad is, in a word, superb. The best one out there bar none. I've never been a major intense user of a Mac device before, but once you get used to the ability to down click on quite literally any area of the trackpad, going back to any other non-Apple device feels like a step down. And a quick nod to the size of the trackpad, Apple have just done a great job making sure every reasonably available millimeter has been dedicated to making the thing as large as they possibly can. As for the sound on this thing, we've got two top facing speakers, meaning sound isn't getting lost when you're enjoying music and video. Unlike some laptops, you like to stick their sound output on the bottom of the device, meaning it just gets drowned out by your lap or drowned out by the table you're working on. The speakers on Macs have typically always been and are continuing to be some of the best you can get. The nearest competitor I found on a Windows-based device was the Yoga 9i from Lenovo. I'll put the link above so you can check that thing out. 
whose speakers were, I would describe as powerful and had a larger range, but the credit I would give to the Apple MacBook Air, they just seemed a bit better optimized. All the sound just felt that little bit more crisp as if the equalization out of the box was better from Apple than perhaps what I'd seen from Lenovo. And this is the 720p webcam that you get with the MacBook Air. It's the same 720p webcam they've been using for years. The difference really being is now they're on the ARM architecture, they can use the same clever software techniques that they've been able to use on the iPhone for the better part of the last God knows how many years to really kind of glow up your image. So definitely getting a better webcam image than I would expect from other 720p webcams. And the microphone in this thing, well, it's not half bad either. So what's the conclusion? Honestly, when I was writing the script for this thing, I was trying really hard not to make this thing sound like a full-blown advert for Apple. And that's coming from a guy who has traditionally been an entrenched Windows user. Now, this isn't the computer to end all other computers. It's not yet in a position to replace a desktop working experience. It isn't anywhere near being able to enter the high-powered PC gaming market. And at this price point, the laptop is still largely inaccessible to the vast majority of potential consumers. But what Apple have managed to do is fill a gap which have traditionally held back users, users like me, from making the leap to Mac OS. And that's, of course, the processing capabilities of the MacBook. Where prior generations of the MacBook simply never had that added horsepower to actually justify making that leap of faith. Well, for me now, that's all changed. In fact, the only thing stopping me going out and getting one of these things right now is that I have a personal preference, 15 and 16 inch size laptop screens. So I'm gonna be holding out till the back end of this year when Apple released their refreshed MacBook Pro 16 inch laptop with their M1X Apple Silicon. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss my review when that hopefully doozy of a laptop comes out. And if you want to take a look at the nearest premium competitor to this thing in the market right now, click the link above to go and check out my review of the Dell XPS 13. And after that eye-opening experience, guys, I think I need to go and have a lie down. If you loved today's video, hit the like button, and I will, of course, see you in the next one.